Hey, Joe Solari here with The Business of Writing, and today we have John Della Rose back to talk about Kickstarters, Indiegogos, and comic books. How are you doing, John? I'm doing great. Thanks. <laughs> good, good. Let me, um, let's me. Uh, let start, just uh, talk about your latest project. I mean, we had you on, um, how long ago was that? Three, Six. four months ago? Maybe six, six months ago, probably. Six months ago, yeah. So yeah. you were working with Richard Fox on his project. Was that your second or third comic book you had done? That was my second, and I learned a ton from that one, which we can go over. I'm actually right now uh, crafting a MailChimp email to send out the digital version of all the files because we just finished up all the art for it, and it's done. So uh, I finally get to get that off my plate right now, which is <laughs> Congratulations. great. Congratulations. Yeah. I know it's a big deal to start ticking off those things that you promised in your uh, Kickstarters. Yeah, it makes me happy. And I think, um, you know, as you get into multiple Kickstarters, last time I was on my second, but I, I actually, uh, because it was Richard's project, he wanted to get going, and because I had my own just right before that, I hadn't really dealt with any of the fulfillment end of things uh, at that point, and now I, I have, so I kind of understand it a little better, uh, understand what people are expecting from that, um, and that's that's actually something you'll learn in, in in the first one, and you'll you'll learn from a couple mistakes maybe, and uh, mm -hmm. you'll you also uh, just get better and faster at doing that. It, it's just like it's just like anything else; it's a skill that takes practice. Sure. So why don't we um, why don't you kind of walk us through that whole? Thing? strategy of you know taking your intellectual property and using something like a crowdfunding platform to make a comic I think that you know for most of the authors that are here this is something they're thinking like well you know I've seen your episode before and it seems like it'd be cool but man it seems like a lot of work so if you could kind of walk through those steps and talk about some of that learning and the differences in the platforms because that's another area where you're experienced you've done Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Absolutely. There's there's comics and there's books, and, and there are two different audiences, yet they're very similar at the same time is what I found out. And so I've obviously uh, done my Amazon business uh, over the past couple of years with my, my book book series, and that's worked really well. Uh, I've put out comic books directly to Amazon also without uh, crowdfunds, just to kind of test that those waters a little bit. And I found that on the comic book end, at least, uh, that um, people are not surfing Amazon so much to look at comic books. So I get my general base audience, but they didn't, they, you know, the people who uh, just read comic books weren't, weren't really seeing it and it didn't really catch on with any sort of algorithm or anything like that uh, to be able to get seen uh, on the comic book level. And that's a lot harder with comics because comic books require a lot more art than regular books. With regular books, you just got to fund your cover Right, and once you're done with that, uh, that that's your primary probably expense other than some editing for for book books. But on comic books, every page is art, and so it costs a lot of money uh, just to produce on the front end. And so you kind of need uh, something a little extra beyond uh, just what Amazon offers to make that viable. Mm -hmm. So that's that's why I went with my first one last summer uh, with Flying Sparks Volume One into a comic book crowdfund. I chose Indiegogo at the time. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, if you want to experiment and you're new at this, Indiegogo offers flexible goals while uh, Kickstarter is all or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So if you uh, are at all nervous about like, you know, maybe I won't get that much backing, but I want to make this anyway. I'm going to produce this no matter how many people come in. If, if 20 people come in and only 20 people buy my book, I'm still going to make it anyway, even if it doesn't meet its crowdfund goal. Uh, Indiegogo might be a good spot for you to try that out because you can still collect the money and uh, even, even whether you hit your goal or not. Okay. Kickstarter, however, is all or nothing, like I said. And so there's a little bit more of a risk there. Um, now, I've been pretty good about this. I hit my, um, my goal uh, for uh, Flying Sparks Volume 1 within three days. The Ember War, because it's a much longer comic, and because I uh, had a very expensive cover artist, uh, Graham Nolan from uh, DC Comics, on that one uh, at the time, we had to have a much higher goal, so it, it took a couple weeks actually to hit the goal on that one. Um, and so those were a little nerve wracking uh, at the time. And I, I guess I don't know. At this point, I know I've got a, a readership base, so I know I can hit a goal to where I'm going to cover my art costs. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to switch platforms. Okay. Uh, now the benefit of Kickstarter versus Indiegogo is that there's a lot more people perusing Kickstarter. Uh, it's it's much more like 
your Amazon of books. It's like, yeah, uh, you can release something on Nook or whatnot, but your audience is a lot more limited. Uh, if you, if you just go there, if you, if you go to Amazon, your audience is, is a lot bigger potentially. Um, and so I went to Kickstarter this time because I w knew that I was going to hit the goal. Uh, was not worried about that. I hit that within, I think five days this time. And, um, I, I just, uh, I didn't need that flexible goal part of the platform. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing Indiegogo offers that Kickstarter doesn't, which was nice about Indiegogo, is that uh, once the campaign's over, it switches to something called in-demand. And in-demand uh, just lets it go on after the campaign is over. So Ember War, uh, for example, uh, finished around $21,000 raised. Mm -hmm. And over the course of in-demand, because I knew I had to make the comic from scratch, we didn't do that one in advance. Um, I knew it would take several, several months. And like I said, I just wrapped that up, even though we uh, crowdfunded that back in September. Um, so I could keep the store open so more people could buy it until I'm ready to print. And that was pretty valuable. It ended up getting me $5,000 over the course of several months here. Now, with my current book, Flying Sparks 2, uh, I don't need that. I'm actually changing my business model a little bit because my crowdfunds were so successful. Mm -hmm. I pre-did all my art before the Kickstarter was done so I could just get it done and just use this more as a pre-order system, get the book out, move on to the next one. So I'm going to be actually shipping these out probably within a month or two after this closes, and I'm not going to need that in-demand extra store uh, because I'm not. I'm, I'm going to have my print runs anyway. They're already going to be done. It's not like I can just add a bunch of extra at this point. So those are the two primary. Those are the major primary differences there: the flexible goal, mm -hmm. uh, the 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 uh, in in-demand store, uh, which are both nice things. And, uh, and then on the other front, there's the just bigger user base. Yeah. So you have to weigh in your, your crowdfunding options, which, which of those is more important to you. And I, I think it very much depends on the project and who you are. Mm. Um, now, having this experience of doing your own stuff where you're the actual writer creator working with an artist, and then the situation with Richard where like, he had already done the work, like the writing, but you were kind of helping him navigate turning that into a graphic novel. What advice or experience have you gotten from that that you could help authors to understand that creative process kind of behind the scenes of the actual Kickstarter? And then just do you have any general feel for like what it costs to hire the artists that are drawing this stuff? Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, the con creation process and scripting, um, as, as a, a stretch goal, I'm actually going to send out the scripts you get. So anybody who backs this can actually just look at my script and see how I break it down for artists. Uh, it's very easy on, uh, my, my original stuff. Cause there's no, there's no template. I can do what I want. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on adapting Richard's work, I definitely, I, I had to break it down. I had to do a lot of work. I had to do a lot of research into his universe. I, I, I had to read not only his first book, but uh, you know, multiple of his books. So I know what's happening later because there's foreshadowing elements for the series and things like that, that people are going to want to see. There was uh, a ton, a ton of work put into that uh, just to break that down. And so um, it was great because I think uh, artistically, um, I personally think you grow as an artist better when you have constraints um, and you're forced and you're forced kind of into, into something. It, it forces you to uh, sort of optimize what you're working within. And that, uh, that actually, is beneficial, I, I believe, when, when you go out and do some stuff that's a little more abstract. Mm. So um, <clears throat> a lot of research. Um, it, it actually, in a lot of ways, it, Ember War ended up easier to make cleaner, I guess, because Richard acted as editor. And so he would come in and look at my script and be like, no, 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 no. This, this is not the right characterization for this, uh, this, uh, this dialogue for this character. You need to rewrite this. Or he'd say, you know, because this happens in book X, I don't want this scene to look like this here. Um, and having, having that, that editorial uh, from somebody so pro like Richard, uh, you know, just, just whipped me into shape real fast. Uh, but that's also a benefit for my new books because I, I've learned from that experience also. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have that on my book. Um, I just, I, I'm actually using my book editors for my novels uh, to just come in and look at my dialogue and just make sure I don't have like redundant word choices and uh, make sure I don't have bad typos. It's, it's much like uh, much like my, my much more like my Amazon process in creating my own work. 
than working in somebody else's adaptation. Um, as far as the artist uh, costs, mm -hmm. it's all over the map. Uh, part of it depends on skill level. Part of it depends on the location of the artist. Um, so if I had my artist on Flying Sparks slash The Ember War uh, who lived in America, he'd probably cost about four times as much as my guy who I actually use who lives in the Philippines. Okay. Now, um, he's, he's a solid pro artist. He's worked um, for Image Comics before. He hasn't gotten to Marvel or DC, but he's, he's done stuff with IDW, who's second in Dark Horse, and um, Dynamite. So those just the tier below that. Um, and I, I've found the art costs a little over $100 a page at that level, um, and so which is not bad compared to what book covers are. And um, you'll find that cover artists, again, with comics, if you want to use a different cover artist, use a little more detailed and a little more uh, you know, into like flashy... I guess because the covers your your advertisement, right? Right. Um, into that, uh, they cost a little bit more too. So, um, I mean, you you'll vary at a professional level. I think from anywhere, you could probably scrape the bottom of the barrel at seventy five dollars a page, uh, but you can get people up to a thousand dollars a page too. So, mm -hmm. it, it, there's a huge spectrum there. If you get below seventy dollars a page, I'm gonna I'm gonna warn you're probably not gonna get uh, pro pro quality product at that point. Yeah. Well, and so much is contingent on that artwork, right? It's got to, they have to be able to take a por portion of that script or that work that you're giving them and interpret that into a drawing, right? Like, so. Absolutely. And they, so their storytelling capabilities is as important as, as my storytelling capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, I leave a lot open to the artist because I figure the artist can visually do things better than me. And you want to be careful about that because I read a book recently and I've seen the script, like I actually edited the guy's script and so I know, I know who he is. And I, I saw the, uh, I didn't get credit for it so you're not gonna be able to pick this guy out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I saw the script and basically what happened was somebody died uh, as a character and it was a major character. And it was a major moment in the script in a major, um, it, it was just a big tense moment that should have been part of the like, you know, gasping as you're, as you're heading to the climax there. Yeah. But, but the artist on the page drew it as a small panel and kind of drew it as a silhouette sort of thing. And so you couldn't exactly tell what was going on. You couldn't tell it was wow. specifically that character. So three pages later, the t characters are talking about how their friend died. And you're like, wait, wait, when did that happen? And, and even though it was a big moment in the script, the artist didn't quite render it right. And mm. it, it actually, it wrecked the story to a big degree. So you, you have to be very careful about that. No, that's a good point. Yeah. It's, um, something that yeah, I guess you have you have to strike that balance and how much control you have and um, and I guess it's tied to what you're prepared to pay right like definitely I mean the, the more you pay somebody the obviously the more uh, they're going to be amicable to uh, to your editorial direction mm -hmm. um, so so what I do from artists uh, is I usually get a layout done which is just like some trick and scratch uh, that just shows kind of how the panels lay out because uh, panel sizes for comics are important too. Like the, the important things you want to be in big panels that are easy to see, the less important things can, you know, go by. You want the action to really pop off the page. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so layout's really important. I don't usually dictate that up front because like I said, I don't think I'm qualified as much as like a professional artist to be able to do that but I do want to see it and I want to give a little editorial push uh, when that happens. Now with my Ember War Flying Sparks guy, um, what happened is I've, I've worked with him so much at this point, I just, I, I skipped that process. Uh, mm. I, I, I did it for the first couple issues of Ember War because just to get Richard comfortable, uh, but I haven't done it on my Flying Sparks stuff for, I, I think, you know, since the first book. Um, and we're, we're working on book three right now. Mm even though book two is up on my Kickstarter. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I just let him go a little faster at this point because I trust him, right? And right, him. right. Uh, so, so definitely there's that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, if you're not paying that much or if you're just collaborating with somebody, I, I get artists talking to me all the time and, and complaining about writers. And uh, they, uh, they, they get really bitter if you, if you really push too far into telling them, you know, what camera angles to use and what, what, you know, their layout should be, uh, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, they, they're like, I'm a professional and, and I'm not getting paid enough to, 
to deal with this. So there's definitely that balance too. Uh, great. So now we kind of talked about the two platforms and what ideas do you have as far as uh, making it successful as far as like picking a goal, um, thinking about different, um, you know, reward levels, that kind of stuff. I know when I did my, um, uh, my audio book, you were quite helpful in kind of helping guide me to some, you know, different price points and goals and followed most of your advice. I think the one big one that I probably should have really thought through was setting that goal a bit lower just because of the sheer stress. I, I tell everybody this too. And yes. Um, and, and again, it comes down to, are you going to make your product anyway and you're going to publish it anyway? Do you, do you really care? Are you, are you not going to produce this if it doesn't get a certain amount of funds up front? Those are two different attitudes to have, right? Um, for my current one, I'm going to produce this book. I already, I already have the book done, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to produce this book no matter what. Now, I set my first goal for volume one at 6000 um, And the approximate interior art cost, not, cut of, not counting the cover, not counting my editing, not counting any of the the printing or anything like that is around $6,000 for flying sparks. Okay. So I did that on the first one. Um, and so I didn't want to go lower on volume two because I didn't want to say, Hey, um, you know, this is less valuable than volume one. Right. Cause, cause there's a psychology to that too. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also didn't want to go higher, even though my, my true costs for everything are probably going to be a little closer to $10,000 once this is all said and done. Um, I, I could I could set it ten thousand dollars and I could wait and hope it funds, but uh, right now as the campaign stands, I'm sitting at eighty six hundred dollars. So I would be two weeks into this campaign fretting that you know am I going to get that last fourteen hundred at any point? Because uh, if it doesn't, uh, Kickstarter just evaporates and goes away. Right? Mm -hmm. I would get none. Uh, so so there is that risk there. And having that stress is huge. I mean, you, you saw it. I, I was trying to push yours a lot uh, because I saw like you were so close for so long. And it's like, come on, get there, get there, get there, get there. <laughs> and, uh, and, and finally it did. It was just like, yay. <laughs> and and that, that changes, you, you know, it, it changes your stress levels a lot, like you said. Yeah. yeah. And it was a lot of work. Like, it, yeah. um, it like I know you're, one of the things you're doing right now is you're here to talk about and we'll talk more about the actual project in a minute, but that's part of the deal is getting your word out there. And I spent a lot of time, most of the stuff I did was um, with authors and their newsletters. And fortunately I, I kind of caught lightning in a bottle with one particular author who does a lot of audiobooks in the same genre. And when it went out, a lot of people on his list were audiobook listeners. So it was like, Oh, okay. I forgot to set up a tracker uh, from when I put it out on my newsletter for how many people came in. I should have, cause I, I would like to know the stats of, of how many people check out other people's stuff when I, when I put it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, newsletters are a good marketing source. Um, you know, obviously these, these YouTube shows and things like that are also a good marketing source. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, uh, back to the, back to the, uh, funding goal level. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's, it's really hard to get to something like $5,000 with the, with a most, your, your main product's 15 bucks, right? So you have to, you have to think about how many people are really going to get there at $5,000 because my comic book's a little bit more expensive. Um, it's, it's about 30 bucks for my main product because I have to pay for a full color printing of a graphic novel and shipping. Um, I can get to $5,000 with fewer backers than if I had a $15 product. Right. So there, there is that to consider when setting it. And I always tell people you really want to set it, especially if you're going to make it anyway, it doesn't matter to you, uh, at a level which you're comfortable that you know, you're going to hit it, uh, which is hard for the first time, of course. Uh, and that you can declare victory early in the campaign. Mm -hmm. There is a psychology to Kickstarter campaigns that is so important that if you are a winner, people are more, are also just more comfortable backing it because they know it's going to get made. They know it's going to be fine. And so they, they come in afterwards. You'll find once you hit, it was really weird. I, I had uh, for this particular one right now, I was really close. And I think day five, I finally, I finally hit over, over the mark and 
it had slowed down tremendously day four and five. Well, as soon as I hit my mark, I had another thousand dollar day. So people mm. just came in because they saw that it was funded and they were just waiting on that. And it, it's, it's an interesting psychology of these things that you really want to captivate that like this book's a winner, this book's great. And you, you have that and, and it being on display like that, much like the Amazon rank, right? Mm-hmm. Is, social, is social proof. And that's yeah. it. Well, the other thing um, from, from authors that haven't done this, maybe you could shed some more light on it, but something that I observed is, um, one, on my own list, there were people, and when I say my list, my, my list for my, my fiction books that, you know, been sending out emails to for, for years, right? There, there was a community on my list that they're v- rabid Kickstarter people, mm-hmm. right? Like spending a lot of money. Like they're not just, in fact, there's a, quite a few that I turned off the follow thing on because it's like, I, this guy must be like, have a trust fund because all he seems to do is back board games and comic books. And so maybe talk a little bit about how you've seen now that you're doing this, it change your audience and find new audiences, that kind of whole customer acquisition piece that comes with trying some of these new. Definitely. I I have a, uh, my audience in particular is a very anti big tech crowd. Mm -hmm. Um, I I have like a, a a sort of rebellious spirit uh, as a readership who they really dislike and distrust these companies like Kickstarter, uh, even Amazon to some extent. And they, they want, they, they would prefer I be on some, you know, no name platform uh, that's just a startup or something like that uh, because they actually want to support that, uh, believe mm-hmm. it or not. And so I actually found uh, that there's a, there was a perception among some of my readership that Indiegogo uh, is, is less big tech somehow than Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, I got a lot of emails when I launched my second campaign, like, why are you on Kickstarter? This is, this is, this is the man, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm on there because everybody's on there and people yeah. check it out, check out books. It's like Amazon. Like you'll have a much better uh, option to get readers looking for you on Amazon than if I just put my book up on my website. Right. Mm. Um, it's, it's just, there's more people frequenting there. And so therefore the, the market caps a lot higher. It's the same thing with Kickstarter and Indiegogo. I think uh, I think Kickstarter is about two to three times as big, uh, at the very least, of people looking for books and comics and games on there. So if that's your kind of your product niche, that's a better spot to be to try to find new customers. I figured when I launched, um, it, this is something I learned here actually uh, during this this uh, one I'm launching right now. I figured when I launched that it wouldn't be a problem. My I have an email list of everybody who backed my last campaign. I have my own email list. I have my blog. All these people frequent all of these things. So they'll find my book and they'll see my book is what I figured. Um, I got so many emails saying, you know, just talking about how they're not, they would not support uh, on Kickstarter. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll wait until there's some other mean to do it because they are just like, um, because my last campaign was on Indiegogo and they're just supporters of Indiegogo. Mm, yeah. It was a very, very odd thing, which I did not, expect when I switched over. So if you are using, if you're intending on checking out both, just, just know that you'll partially lose your audience. Mm. I talked to another creator who went the opposite way. Um, and he had a very successful book on Kickstarter. He then went to Indiegogo for the next mix because he liked the in demand uh, feature. And he found that he lost, uh, about 40% of his Kickstarter audience by doing that also. Mm. So uh, switching platforms, uh, is actually a very bad thing to do. <laughs> is what I learned. Um, so it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I know from direct selling, um, stuff, there is a portion of my audience that, um, that's the only way they'll buy things like, and they want to net they they pay top price and I make a lot more money, but it's like, it's just their philosophy that, you know, they're not going to buy from the man. I get it. That's great. It's, um, I think it's your duty as a, uh, uh, if you're selling your, your IP to try and get it out as many ways as possible, including direct sale. Right. So absolutely. Um, 
So maybe that's something that some of those folks you can recapture after the fact just by. You know. I, I think so. And, and, and to some extent, I know so. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that's definitely part of my game plan is I put these books up here, which covers the art cost, and then I put them on Amazon and a direct store afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, then I keep going. And, and my book is still selling uh, via, via Amazon and through that direct store for book one. Um, and I would say I, I've gotten, I, I think an extra, um, what, what was that about? About an extra, about 25% in sales for that. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's just gravy on top at this point. I see no reason to, uh, hold, hold out on, on putting those books up on other platforms afterwards for sure. Mm -hmm. Have you tried ever, um, selling direct, just using like PayPal links and emails for the comic books after the fact? I have not done that, but I might do it on this one. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that since you have those lists, that might be something if you, before your print run, you could run a couple extra hundred copies or whatever. And Yeah, I'm definitely, um, that's, that's part of the plan because I, I did have enough people voicing that they didn't like my switch in platforms yeah. that I'm going to just send out a, an email saying, hey guys, if you didn't like the platform, but you still want to back the book, there you go. Yeah. Um, and that's, uh, I think that's the way to cater towards those customers. I mean, I don't, I don't care how people want to read or how people want to buy the book. I just want them to read and buy the book. Right. 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 Yeah. And you know, it just, th that's how you're respectful of their, your customer base. And it's like, not everybody, some, you know, I found this out. There's some people that even though they know that they could do, get the cheaper pre-sale from me direct from my newsletter, and it even uploads via book funnel, which is probably one of the easiest ways to do it. They're just lazy. And they're like, ah, I'll just, I'll pay, I'll do the pre-sale on Amazon like I always do. And it's like, I get it. I'm kind of that way with a lot of things. It's like, well, it's easy. Just hit the button Absolutely. and it loads and I'm done, right? And that's why they are commanding the kind of marketplace, you know, or market um, shares they have. My favorite customers, though are the ones that when I, uh, cause I, I also, I also run a Patreon and I put up my comics on Patreon. So my subscribers get my comics there too. My favorite are my subscribers who are on Patreon who then buy the book on Kickstarter and then also buy the book on Amazon to help me with the sales rank there. Those people are just gems and I love you if you are watching this. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk specifically about the project. Like uh, this, you're kind of, this isn't just like, oh, I'm giving it a try. You said this is the second, but it's really, you're already working on the third. So maybe kind of back up and we'll get a little less businessy and talk more about like, you know, what's kind of the, the concept of the comic book? Sure. How many units you're thinking, like, you know, issues are you thinking of doing? All that kind of stuff. And Sure. I, um, I started this comic book because I wanted, um, basically, um, I, I'm going to go back to, I think, 2008 when there was a, a comic book called Batgirl, you might have heard of. Mm -hmm. um, and there, but there's a specific version of it where they uh, didn't, they had a different character as Batgirl. And, uh, and her, the character is Steffi Brown, and they canceled it. Um, and uh, they decided to relaunch everything and reboot the universe and, and got the old one back. Um, I was actually just very annoyed that that book was canceled. It had like a, uh, it almost had like a Buffy the Vampire Slayer feel to it. And it was just beautifully done um, all around from the art to the writing. And uh, I just wanted that feeling again from the comic book. And uh, like, like I, like I want to do at this point, I, I just decided to create it myself since that was not being filled in the marketplace. Mm. And so that's where my character Meta Girl from Flying Sparks came about. Now, I was working on a different concept at the time, which was I'd like to do a book from a villain's perspective, just kind of like trying to keep his head low, do his crime to make himself money. <laughs> like one of those like honorable villain types, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so I, both of these concepts were in my head at the time. And I'm, I thought, well, what if they were dating each other and they didn't, they didn't realize it? Like <laughs> you know, they didn't realize that they're basically their own worst enemies. So it's like a Mr. and Mrs. Smith, but superheroes kind of concept, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, uh, so that's, that's where this came about. And so I made a book just to see what was going on um, and just see how it went. And I put it up last year for sale. Uh, finally, I, I, I paid for art over years. Uh, I was just doing it for fun. And I, what I did, uh, this is an interesting way you might, might be able to fund a comic book if you think it's a bit much. 
uh, because there's a lot of, a lot of pages. I would just like save a hundred, two hundred dollars out of my paycheck every month and just pay the artist as I went along. And over, you know, the course of a year or two, I, I had like three issues worth of comic books or one graphic novel as it ended up being right. And so I put that up for sale. It went gangbusters last summer and I was able to parlay that into, I, I'm the type to just reinvest back into my business. So I, when, I just when you say to, put it up for sale, where did you put it up for sale? That was on uh, Indiegogo last year. Okay. So a little after we were a little before we were first talking last time. Okay. Um, so, um, I just got them back to work on it again, got them back to work on the Ember War because we did that one. Um, and then worked with a couple artists to make some books. Uh, Flying Sparks, I, I, I mentioned, uh, I don't know if you're gonna cut this out uh, because of the edits at the beginning, but I mentioned I'm like a Renaissance man who's like really into just different types of art. And um, if, you, if you did cut that out, my, uh, my statement was that, look, the best way to make money is obviously just stick with one thing. Mm. <clears throat> you see with books, that if you just do a single series that's the same genre and you stick with it, uh, people really flock to that because they love that binge read. They lo- they know what they can expect from the books, um, and it's and it's good. And um, that's definitely the way to go on that that front if you can do that. I like to try different things, and I like to just explore different concepts in my writing and all that. So I have my Flying Sparks. I did the Ember War. They're very different comic books, even though it's the same creative team. Um. But I go all over the map with that, and Flying Sparks was no different. So when I envisioned this, I thought, okay, I've got my comic book. I would also like to do an origin story where it's like I hire an actress to go on YouTube uh, because the character actually does not have powers. She's using gadgets. And so I wanted to make like a science class video blog where she's like learning to use these gadgets, and she's just talking about it on YouTube and just pretend like it's real. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I was going to have her origin kind of weave into the storyline uh, through comics that ended up being a little too ambitious. <laughs> um, so I haven't done that. I've written several of the scripts, but, uh, I tried to pull that off, tried to get an actress. It didn't work out. Um, I also wrote, uh, a few radio dramas because there's another character who's kind of like a old timey legacy character, superhero. And I've got, uh, scripts for radio dramas. So, you know, so, uh, like, like the old green Hornet or the shadow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I want to weave those into the universe also. So I've created this like really robust universe and really robust world building around uh, what looks like just a simple comic about a superhero and villain dating relationship. Um, And as this progresses, as it grows, I want to build that out. Um, This current storyline, I'm telling it like uh, comics used to be like in the 80s and 90s. Right now, when you read a comic book, you can't pick up an issue two or issue three, uh, you know, because you won't even understand what's going on. It's, It's really rough. Um, and so the graphic novels are everything in those extents, but the old way that things were done, uh, every issue kind of had its own story and right. every issue had like a beginning, a middle and end its own arc. And even, and, and often they were parts of larger arcs, like they'd be building into something. You'd see Spider-Man, he's, he's fighting the Kingpin and the Kingpin's got this gang war going on, uh, with the Rose and, and over several issues, They just layer some stuff in and it keeps building and it finally has that climax issue. But Mm -hmm. Spider-Man might be going off and fighting Electro in the middle of that and that was that issue. So that's, that's, I wanted to create Flying Sparks like an ongoing comic, like, like, you know, we're in that area because that's what I grew up on and I love it. Um, And so that's what I did. And so book one has its own stories. It's got three separate chapters or issues in it. um, And it did that. Book two continues on. It's the, the main plot's building and getting thicker but each issue still has its own thing. You can totally read book two uh, without reading book one. I definitely think you'd probably like it a little better if you started with book one, which is also just available on the Kickstarter. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the, I've got a huge world going on with it. Um, my main storyline right now, I've, I'm trying, I've got it plotted out for five volumes for like the m- main first arc. Um, and that's where everything's going to build toward. And that's where, that's where it's really going to climax. Uh, but again, these are all still standalone, uh, I, I guess, uh, storylines in between also. So if you're thinking like five volumes, um, and I'm assuming each one of those is going to be a separate Kickstarter or Indiegogo, mm-hmm. I should say crowdfunding to be generic. Um, how are you thinking about timing wise, seeing as you decoupled production from that, right? You're just, you got your production schedule over here. Yeah. 
So uh, at, at first it was production schedule. It was, I did it and it finished up and that was the production schedule. Yeah. yeah. But then, then I kind of waited until I had everything ahead of time so I could get things faster out to backers because it's my theory that backers would appreciate getting their product a lot faster than a lot slower. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I, I, I can't, I don't have any scientific evidence about that, but I am going to guess just by human nature that is the case. Hmm. Um, so, um, I figured it'd be best just to be able to close it, ship, move on to the next one, close it, ship. Now, I think with crowdfunds, there's a limit to what you can do. I don't think you can, I don't think you can do these little speed, uh, releases like, like we see from a lot of our favorite authors on Amazon, where these guys are now getting to the point where they're trying to release something every week or two right. um, and people are eating it up. I mean, that's easy to do and easy when you're doing a two ninety nine or four ninety nine buy, mm -hmm. uh, to, to get people to buy in on. Uh, to get people to buy in on a $30 comic book, I don't think I can do it that often. So I'm planning on doing a new Flying Sparks volume about every half year. Okay, so every so, six months. Yeah, and that also uh, allows my artist to stay out of the game because he can finish uh, those three issue chunks in six months w without without much problem. Okay, well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think there would be because of the way that it, you're – you're doing that, you would have to, you don't want to oversaturate your customers, right? And that, Definitely not. You know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do, I think, a Kickstarter every quarter at this point because I think I can keep up with that. And I'm keeping the Flying Sparks like that. So you'll, my, my thought is my customers can expect a Flying Sparks volume every six months and then another project in between. So mm -hmm. like, you know, I had Flying Sparks, then add the Ember War, volume two, I'll have another superhero book I'm going to try to launch this summer and Flying Sparks 3 in the fall. Um, I'm at, just timing-wise, uh, there, there's something business-wise for Kickstarters and, and all that that people should recognize too. Timing-wise, I don't have a way to do it every quarter just yet because I feel like what I saw was from other people's stuff is that if you put a book up in November, December, or January, uh, you get a lot less traffic because people are in that whole Christmas thing or they're burnt out on that whole Christmas thing. Mm -hmm. And so they're not, they're not buying things uh, that are going to be pre-orders coming later at that point. Yeah. So I, I would, I would definitely pay attention to that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So and I'll make sure that um, as we go through this, that, you know, we cut in on the, the pages and there'll be links to this um, current flying sparks volume to mob ties um, Kickstarter page so people can go do that. Talk, you know, a, another shameless plug, kind of talk about your, um, your levels, your reward levels and kind of what you're thinking is like, I think besides just kind of talking about what people can get, which is cool, but also like how you're thinking about the value proposition at those different levels. Absolutely. Um, so a book for uh, printing uh, by itself for at, a, at my pages just with a full color uh, just costs they cost about four or five dollars to print by themselves so there is that that's just the printing not even not even counting the shipping to me and then the shipping uh, after that uh, just the print costs are going to be that so you have to uh, make enough value for the book to pay for not only the print costs but your art and then to make this worth your time to do right mm -hmm. um, so I found a price of about twenty five dollars for my print edition made sense because then uh, it's $5 for the actual product itself. $20 is, uh, is, is then what's left over. Um, and then that, that's what's going towards my sunk costs, which are my uh, art costs of about six grand. So mm -hmm. I figured getting $20, uh, I, I only needed how many backers at that point? I, I got to do the math here and I can't, why can't I do this in my head? I should be able to do this in my head. Um, it's about 300 backers in order to break even at that point, right? Okay. If they just bought that. And, uh, I thought, you know what, I can get to 300 backers. That's about perfect to cover this. That's not going to be a problem. So that was my, my price point on that, uh, to, to try to try to make that happen. Now I actually make less on my digital books, uh, than I do on my print books because of that. Um, my, my digital versions, I put at $10. I had them at $12 last time. Um, and I, my thought was last time that it's three issues. If you go to a comic book store to buy three issues of comic books, they're three ninety nine dollars each. Um, so you, to get three issues of comic books, that would be $12 mm -hmm. approximately, you know, 
seven or whatever it is. But, uh, but that is the same value as uh, what you'd buy from Marvel or DC uh, at a comic book store. So that's why I tried to price it at that point. I wanted to get a little better impulse buying from customers and give a little bit better value proposition this time. So I actually pushed the digital a little bit lower. And I did that uh, just mainly as a like, you know, uh, incentive for more customers to come on digitally. Um, and also because it's a lot harder to do like later on on Amazon when I want to put the book up as a Kindle edition, uh, they, they like you being at nine ninety nine kind of as a, uh, as a maximum on that. Okay. So that's a, uh, that's a, uh, strategic point on that. So those are my two main goals, but on Kickstarter, um, there's a couple, there's, there's some things you got to think about. One, the whole point of the platform is that you've got all these different tiers. When you sell a book on Amazon, you have one tier. If you have a, a buyer who's a cheapskate, uh, they will pay cheapskate prices and that's it. If you have a buyer who's expensive right, and, and willing to just throw money at you because they love you, they're still going to pay the same price. Mm -hmm. um, and so Amazon just allows you to get whatever your book price is and it doesn't allow you to maximize your utils as a, uh, as, as, as econ likes to put it. Yep. <laughs> um, and that's what Kickstarter allows you to do. It allows you to get backers who are stratified, who if they really want to support you, they can do different things. If they really just uh, are cheap and just want to, you know, uh, go, go for those sort of options. They can do that too. And so I put up some, some lower tiers also. Um, my first one is just a dollar and it just says add to the backer count and support the cause. Thank you very much. And, uh, honestly people come in and just back for a dollar. I, yeah. they, don't, they don't get anything out of it. Um, it's, I told you to do this on your campaign too. I, I was surprised. <laughs> and you know what? I was surprised how there was quite a, like several hundred dollars of people that just gave me money and didn't want anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Like at, at where they certainly would have qualified for levels. Right. And these weren't like friends that were just like, giving money, like, it's just random people sometimes and they just yeah. want to support mm -hmm. and that's absolutely cool. God bless them. I love you, you know? Yeah. Um, and, but you want to have that option on there for them to just do that and not have, you know, and, and that's valuable. Um, and it sounds really bizarre and you would think nobody would do this, but I I've gotten backers every time at that, at that level, just saying, thank you. Um, I also put out a, in case somebody really just wants to check it out and not sure, um, a, a sort of first issue look, which is my first 22 page issue from the first volume. Um, and so it's a third of the first volume. Uh, the value proposition is not quite as good. Uh, you know, if they, if they went and bought the whole book at 10, uh, they, they get a little better value for it, but, uh, they bought it at $5. Um, and they can at least just check something out. So for somebody who just has that, cause that's, that's a, a, about the maximum impulse impulse buy price point is four ninety nine five dollars And that's, that's why you see a lot of indie authors selling at that point on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So I've got that on there too. Now what I'm going to do with them is when I deliver this to them at the end of the campaign, um, I'm going to say, Hey, do you want the rest of the book? I'll, I'll give you a special offer on that and, and come up with a link for them to, to buy uh, the rest of the book um, if they liked it. And that, mm -hmm. that, that's how I'll be able to capture more of that. Um, beyond that, um, I found this is a, a thing that's kind of exclusive to the comic book industry. Um, but I put up a variant cover and uh, it's a different cover that is only going to be available on the campaign. And I just put it for an extra 10 bucks. Um, it's my main character in a swimsuit because uh, people like girls, yeah. uh, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that is just like, you know, you get it, you get a, a kind of sexy drawing and uh, it's limited and people will go for that. Yeah. So I didn't want to way overprice it. I feel like I could have, um, cause I've seen people on these campaigns do that. Um, I've also seen campaigns do not safe for work, even more limited versions that are even more expensive. I will not do that personally. That's my limit. Um, I don't, I don't want my, my, I don't want to produce, uh, that sort of content. Um, but, uh, that is an option for those who are willing to do that. Uh, definitely people will pay for that. And I've seen people pay absurd amounts of dollars for that. Mm. Um, and then I, from there, I just do multiple packages of like, you know, mix and match of digital or, you know, you want a volume one and volume two, you want, uh, you want the, you want both covers, you want things like that up the chain. Now, um, 
Let's see, that goes all the way up to. So you got one for a thousand bucks. Yeah, so I'll get to those. So once I get past all the different mix and matches of the various books, and by the way, um, I saw a author, her name's uh, Blake Northcott, um, and she uh, put up her book book, uh, just just regular um, novel for on Kickstarter last year. Um, she actually did put up a variant cover of her novel, um, and 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 did a uh, extra pricing for it. Said it was limited. It's not going to be the version that's going to be on Amazon. And people uh, went in and bought that. And she made a lot of money doing that. I think she made thirty or forty thousand dollars on her book uh, on Kickstarter last year. Mm. So. Uh, for authors, I wouldn't actually shy away from doing variant covers of your novels. That's actually something, uh, you know, collectors might be interested in, something to think about. Well, I know with mine, um, my top level, the big thing was is I was doing a, you know, a faux leather copy of the book that I was yeah. doing limited That's edition. That's cool. And that was, you know, I'm not going to make any money really on those. Um, it was just something kind of cool to do. Um, when you look at all the stuff, but it was also kind of like, it seems like what you're doing is like kind of exploring what, you know, people are prepared to pay for content. Absolutely. Um, and that, that's where I go after I go to all my books. I didn't do a leather bound sort of edition on this. Um, I'm, I, you know, I might do something like that later. I, I feel like once I have all five volumes out and then I do like a leather band omnibus yeah. or something like that. Yeah. That might be a better way to go on this particular project. Well, and with comics, but, there's always like, yeah. you, you want that visual on the cover, whether it's hard cover Absolutely. or like part of the thing is the, the picture. Right. right. Yeah. It's a, it's an interesting thing, but we'll see. Um, I, I do like the idea for sure, but comics also offer some other uh, options. And so my artist, um, said he'd be willing to do some sketches and things like that. And so mm -hmm. I didn't want to bog down his time too much. And it's hard, it's hard for him to actually get those, uh, you know, out to the United States from the Philippines and all that. It's, it's kind of an ordeal. So I priced those at 200 for people who wanted to go um, to that, those higher levels and like really support. Um, and so you can get like a, a personalized one of a kind sketch. And that's uh, a, that, that, that's a nice thing uh, to be able to offer here. Um, as a writer, we can do extra things. And so at 250, I put in, you know what, you can name a character. Mm. And um, that worked really well last time. Uh, I, I made some good money off of, of naming the characters. I have a lot less options to do so, be, being this is volume two and a lot of the characters are already named. Mm. Um, but there are some still, so I'm, I'm, I put that in there. Um, and I think I got, uh, I got somebody, he, he's, a, he's a very nice fan of mine. And so far, he's only come up with names like Bob McBobface. And I'm like, dude, please, please don't make me put this in my book. <laughs> but there's that. Yeah. Um, so uh, you got to be careful because uh, you never know. Uh, you never know what we're going to come up with. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then finally, I put a thousand dollar markup, which is just the original art of the cover. And um, a guy named Gary Shipman did that cover. He's a well-renowned comic artist. Um, there's only one copy of the the you know cover art and so if somebody wants that for like some some sort of framing piece or whatever they can, yeah. they can really come in big and um i i think it's always good you never know if there's gonna hit um i uh, didn't have that option on my last one um and but i i think you always want a really big tier in case you got a super fan out there who really really wants to come in because you don't want to you don't want to lose that potential i mean if mm -hmm. there's somebody who wants to put a thousand dollars toward this I want that somebody to be able to put a thousand dollars on it and to get something really cool. Right. Um, you can't, I, I feel like, uh, naming a character that, that wouldn't quite be right for a thousand bucks. Like it, you know, two fifty feels, feels pretty right on that. Yeah. Uh, and this is just a feel thing. I don't, I, there's no real answer. I mean, if you're, if you're Michael J. Sullivan, probably naming a character might be a thousand bucks, right? Because you're a much bigger author than I am. But, uh, but the you cover art, yeah. On that subject, what's crazy about him is like his his top tier level. You actually can go and stay at his house, and it's I know I thought, bucks. I honestly like looked at that and I was like, "Dang, I really want to do this, and I almost want to do it." And then I I hemmed and hawed about it for like two days, and then it was sold out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next book, you just got to jump on that. One. I just got to jump on that one. I mean, that is really cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that I'd open my house. I'm, I'm a bit too scared of the internet for that. So, but 
But I guess if somebody, if somebody loves me enough to give me a thousand dollars, maybe, maybe I would open my house. I don't know. You know, I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a very personal question right there, but, but God bless Michael J. Sullivan for doing that. For yeah. Sure. Well, and you don't know, like they're out in the woods of Virginia. You try something funny. You may not ever come out of the woods of Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm not saying, um, no, I, I completely agree that auth, uh, when I talk to, you know, traditional kind of book authors and they hear some of these levels of people prepared to pay and it's like, you're wildly more successful than I am with my fiction. You, you owe it to your fans to try this out and give them stuff, right? Like there's no reason why you can't be selling bobbleheads and everything else that you want to, to your fans in this day and age, because you can get the stuff made, you control the IP and you, you got a great way to test it out and something like you're doing right now. Absolutely. And I actually try to put a little bit of that testing in the uh, tiers. And I also put them in the stretch goals. For those that aren't, aren't thinking about stretch goals, stretch goals are, uh, you tell your audience, it gives them more incentive to come in basically past funding. So once you get your funding, you're saying, hey, at my next goal, I'm going to add in, you know, three pinups or something like that to you know, give, give a little more art. Mm -hmm. Things like that, that just add to the content in order to just make it more enticing and also to incentivize people to keep, uh, pushing your book through the campaign. Mm. Um, and so I, uh, I mentioned earlier that I'm, I'm really into all these different ideas like, uh, you know, doing, doing a YouTube show uh, based on the book or, or putting out a radio drama. I, I put the radio drama as a very high stretch goal because to produce it, I don't know what that would cost for real. And so I figured if I'm making 50 grand off the book, uh, I'm not going to have a problem producing a radio drama, right? Mm, um, yeah. So I put it there because I'd never done that before. So that's a, you know, that'd be an experiment. Um, and if, and if it hit it, that'd be amazing. I'd love to, I'd love to be able to do that. But I also put on there, uh, one of my, one of my, uh, cover artists is uh, a very, very beautiful lady. Um, and, uh, she's, you know, known for that, for, 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 for her looks and for her wonderful art. And so, uh, she actually agreed that she would, uh, dress up as my main character and do like a oh, cool. photo shoot at a certain level. So I, I put that on there as like an extra incentive. So there's all sorts of creative things you can do to add extra value for your backers. And it's just, mm. uh, it's a lot of fun. Well, again, it's been, uh, it's time's flown as we've talked through this stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm always fascinated by the stuff you're doing with, um, all the different media that you're playing in. Um, one last question. Like I know a lot of the stuff you're writing is steampunk. And there's certainly never enough good steampunk out there. Have you thought about steampunk in comics and why, you know? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned with my last campaign also that I made enough that I sort of just hired a bunch of artists for a bunch of different comics. One of those that I'm working on is a steampunk uh, book. It's going to be called, or comic book. It's going to be called Clockwork Dancer. And uh, it's uh, going to be following Her Majesty Queen Victoria's uh, Secret Service. Uh, which is basically the precursor to MI5. Okay. So um, that's, that's in development. Uh, the artist uh, has a day job and it's going along really slowly, but it is going along. <laughs> I, it might be two, three years before that comes to fruition. Um, but I'm also talking about adopting my novel, uh, adapting my novel in, uh, for Steam and Country into comics because uh, that's been my bestseller by far so far. Uh, people have asked me if I'm going to do a comic version of it. Um, for steampunk, especially because it's so much about the aesthetic, um, mm -hmm. I really want the right artist that's going to be super detailed, draw very intricate costumes, uh, just just make it look absolutely beautiful. So um, it's going to be a costly uh, sort of setup uh, yeah. to get that level of an artist. And I want to make it perfect uh, for my main property. So the answer is yes, um, and just not right now. <laughs> yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. Well, John, it's been great having you on. And for everybody that's watching, please go check out his Kickstarter, Flying Sparks Volume 2. Um, it's, uh, it is funded, but it can always use more because you've got some amazing stretch goals here that if they get triggered are going to be cool, um, not just to participate in, but for anybody that's in the content creation community to see, you know, you succeed or fail at like making a radio show. <laughs> yeah, it's fun stuff. Yeah. You can be out there being the explorer. 
you know, maybe you'll find Oregon. Maybe the Indians will kill you. I don't know. We'll, we'll tell stories about you once you go out there and do this stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> Any last comments? Um, yeah. Oh, another stretch goal I'd like to play with, which is a cool one. And this is going to be one that I think a lot of people who watch this show can engage your own community if you try to do books or anything in. Um, I went around to a bunch of comic creators I know who are doing Kickstarters and things like that. And I said, you know what? You're doing a series like me. Will you give me your number one issue in a PDF? And at a stretch goal, I'll just give out like the whole community's number one issues mm. uh, so that everybody can check out uh, just all the stuff through the community. Um, and so at $10,000, which I, I'm very confident I'm going to hit probably before this, uh, this even goes up uh, on YouTube, um, I, people are getting 200 pages of just different comics from different people in the community. And uh, one, it builds the community uh, of authors around you, which is good. Mm. Um, and then you can exchange, do things back and forth, promote each other. Um, but it also builds a community of readerships that's, that's, uh, that's kind of wide and, and within, uh, within, it, within a group. And we definitely want more of that, I think. Uh, you know, as indies, we often go it alone so much uh, that, it, that it can get a little frustrating. Mm. So having as much community as possible, I think, is, is a great way to go. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's something I kind of observed when I was trying to drum up uh, customers for mine. And granted, mine was a little different than what other people were offering. But when I would reach out to other people that were running uh, Kickstarters, they, it seemed like they were like, well, what do you mean you want a, me to shout out about your stuff and my stuff? It's not like with the indie author community where like a newsletter swap is just such an obvious marketing tool. It's like, oh, you write steampunk, I write steampunk. We probably have customers that are looking for your book and just don't know about you. Whereas yeah. I, I wish I thought of it like while I was promoting your steampunk audiobook, I could have just given out a free ebook of mine on your campaign. Uh, but I thought about it afterwards. So, <laughs> well, you can, no, you can still yeah. do that. Like we, you know, I haven't sent out the, um, on my thing, I, I haven't sent out the card that's going to have eBooks on it. So I'm any authors that want to put, provide eBooks, I'm sending them out. And I've got some great authors that are providing, just like you said, their first book um, on those cards. So cool. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for coming on again. And we'll definitely check in with you and see how this goes. And uh, when you hit that $70,000, we can... Maybe you'll invite me to the photo shoot. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs> See ya.